If you've got your Bibles with you, go ahead and start turning to the 102nd Psalm. So Psalm 102. That's where we're going to be studying this evening. But while you're turning there, I want you to start thinking to yourself, what is your favorite part of your relationship with God? Or more specifically, what is your favorite gift that you've received because of your relationship with God? Um, would anybody like to raise their hand and, and tell me what, what your favorite gift is from God? And the Bible. Hearing the words of God spoken directly. To have a book that, that, is, that never changes, that tells us God's eternal will for us. That's hard to beat. Or it's another one. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. To have those sins that we're all guilty of put away and not, never remembered again because we have a, a God who is merciful. What's another one? Prayer. What is it about prayer that makes that your favorite aspect or one of your favorite aspects? Well, I stopped there on Jimmy because that's what this psalm is about. The psalm is about a prayer. And this psalm teaches us why we need prayer in our lives. It, it is, there are so many gifts from God that if we tried to rank them, we wouldn't be very successful because they're all perfect and great and good. But like Jimmy just said, prayer is very intimate with our God. It is where we get to make our requests known to Him. And we get to see the results of that giving, merciful, forgiving God. I'll have you take, uh, take note here when we look at Psalm 102. The first thing I want us to notice is there's a title over this psalm. Which, uh, if you've got your Bible in front of you, who's got a title above the psalm there? And what, is, what does your psalm say? Somebody want to share what their psalm uh, title says? What is that? The Lord's Eternal Love. The Lord's Eternal Love. Yep. What's another one? Comfort and mercy of God. Does anybody have another? Do not hide your face from me. Okay. So I've got the, the New King James here in front of me. And see, I've got where it says the Lord's eternal love. And that, that phrase there is put in by the people who made the New King James translation. But underneath that is in italics. Do you guys have italics under that? Or sorry, not in italics. It's not in italics. It's actually in regular print. I'm sorry. And it says, A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. Do you have that? See, that, that phrase was not put in there by the New King James translators. It wasn't put in there by the ESV or whatever translation you have in front of you. That inscription is what we might refer to it as is pretty ancient goes back to the Masoretic texts, at least. It, it goes back to uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is dated back to about 300 B.C. This is, these inscriptions we don't believe are original to the biblical text. So it's not like David wrote this inscription above it, but it was written by, uh, as far as we can tell, by rabbi. Uh, and in many cases... Jesus refers to these titles. So in a way, we have a kind of a confirmation that at least some of these titles above these psalms are at least correct. <laughs> it's a good description of what we're going to find in this psalm. And so let, let's read that again. It is a prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. It's a powerful statement right there. There's a lot in there. And that first thing I want us to notice is it's a prayer of the afflicted. Do we ever feel afflicted in our life? Do we, do we deal with struggles, with stress? Do we feel like the odd one out of the crowd? Oh, yeah. We feel like we don't belong. Oh, yeah. This is a prayer for you. It's a prayer for every single one of us because at some point in our life, we experience this. 
And what we're going to see in this prayer, what we're going to learn from it is three things. I want you to be thinking about these three things while we go through this psalm. Number one is that God listens. Number two is God cares. And number three is God endures. And, the reason, and these three things answer a question that we need to ask. Why should I pray? We should pray because God is listening. We should pray because God cares about what you want to pray about. And we should pray because God endures forever. And so for eternity, he will be able to answer those prayers for us. Psalm 102 is a reminder for us that no matter what, we, what stress we face in life, we're able to go to God in prayer without question. So I want us to look at this psalm here, and we're going to go through this pretty much verse by verse, and I want us to see what, uh, what this psalm writer has for us to understand about our relationship with God in prayer. So beginning in verses 1 and 2, we're going to see full on here that first point, that God listens. We, can, uh, we should pray to God because he listens to us. Look at verses 1 and 2. It's a, he writes, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me. In the day that I call, answer me speedily. So, in this, this first verse, notice something. The psalmist is bringing his sorrows to God. Isn't that what we see there? He's talking about his sorrows. He's talking about his cries. And, he's, and, and you hear in those words an air of confidence. Do you hear that? Because he says, let, what does he say? Let my cry come to you. When he asks, or when he says this statement, we should not hear an ounce of doubt when he, when he makes this statement. He says, let, meaning I know that you're going to receive that cry. He can confidently come before God and say, hear what I have to say. And then that last phrase there might sound, in verse 2, might sound a little bit arrogant. What does he say in the last, uh, the last uh, uh, phrase? In the day that I call, of verse 2, in the day that I call, answer me speedily. Wow, he's got, a, he's got some nerve, doesn't he? <laughs> asking God to hurry up. Is he, is he asking God to hurry up? Is he saying that he's got a time limit? Hey, hey, I need, I need, to, I need to hear an answer now. What, what do you think the psalmist is really trying to get at here? Hmm? Trying to get your attention. He's trying to get our attention for sure. But he's speaking to God. And if he tells God, answer me speedily, what is he communicating to, to God and to us as the reader and the potential singer of the psalm? What's that? He's what? I'm sorry. He's hurting. Yes, absolutely. If I, yes? Desperation. Desperation. Okay. He's, there might be some, uh, something going on in his life that a quicker answer might be helpful. But pair that with what he's been saying. He says, God, let, let my cry come before you. Okay. So he's, he's got this air of confidence in what he's saying. He says, do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Does that sound like somebody who actually thinks that God is going to hide his face from him? No. He's, he's already shown us that he's confident in who God is. That, so he knows that God is not going to hide his face from, here, uh, from him. Incline your ear to me. Does he sound like he actually does, thinks that God's not going to listen? No. And so when he says, answer me speedily, is he not... Showing confidence that God's answer is absolutely going to come. So on one hand, he, he goes God, uh, to God with confidence. He knows that God can, uh, is going to listen to him. And he knows that that listening is going to result in an answer. So when he says, God, answer me speedily, he's not, he's not you know, trying to 
you know, force God to, to do anything. He is stating for us this confidence he has that God is not going to forsake his questions. He's not going to forsake his prayer. God is listening. God is hearing him. And he's not listening in a way that some of us listen to sermons. <laughs> he's, he's, he's listening actively. And that's for me too. Sometimes I fail in how I listen to sermons. No. <laughs> he's actively listening. He's listening to what we're saying. And he's already thinking about how he is going to answer that. And in fact, he's God. So he's already figured out the answer. So... What we see here is this as well, that God is one who welcomes his children to boldly come before his throne, right? Boldly come before the throne of grace. We have, we have been uh, given an astounding privilege in the church that we can come before God, the creator of the universe, and for whatever reason, he is so loving, so merciful, so caring that he lets little old us tell him about our problems and make requests to him. And he's really listening to us. So why do we fail sometimes in keeping that part of our relationship with God up? Why do sometimes we forget to pray? Sometimes sermons or Bible class studies um, shine a light on, on the preacher himself. And I could tell you all this, that I, am, I have a lot of room to grow when it comes to my prayer life. I need to get better about making sure I make time to pray with God more often. And so I ask myself, and I wonder if you guys ask yourself, what are the circumstances that make us do that? What makes me not go to the greatest wealth of blessing in the universe on a regular basis, on an often basis, on an intimate basis? Distractions. Distractions. Things get in the way, right? What's that? Laziness. Sometimes we let the cares of the world get in our way. Sometimes we just don't make the time to, uh, for prayer. Disobedience. We're not actually being faithful in our daily life. We've got another. That's absolutely right. It doesn't have to be a long thing. So sometimes we, we forget to pray. I pray because we have like, a, a, we put an un, a, like a non-biblical expectation on ourselves of what our prayer is supposed to be. Uh, a prayer can be simply, I love you, God. Can it? Yeah. Yes, Willie. Hmm. <laughs> We fool ourselves with that a lot, don't we? <laughs> this is a little thing. I won't bother God with this. I'll, I'll try and handle it myself. And then we start doing that to more and more things. And eventually, well, we've left God out of the picture altogether. Yes. What's that? Being busybodies. We're too involved in what other people's business than to deal with our own business with God. Yeah. Here's a couple other ones that I was thinking of. Maybe we're ashamed. Have you ever not prayed because you knew that you were doing wrong and felt ashamed to go before God? If it's been a while since you last prayed, I'm going to, I want to give you a little bit of a, of a helpful tool. If it's been a while since the last time you prayed, here's what you can do. And this may help you reignite that fire you had once for praying to God and do it more. Picture the last time 
that you know for sure that God answered a prayer of yours. Now, it might take some thinking. It might, you might have to like really uh, dig deep. And I can think of one off the top of my head. And this is one that I always tell people about because I don't know how else it, it can be explained. Um, when, I first, when I got my first job that was at Toys R Us, I'm sure you're all sh- shocked that I wor- worked at Toys R Us. Um, <laughs> I was working at Toys R Us, and when I got that job, I told them, look, I can't work Wednesday evenings, and I can't work Sunday because I go to church. And they said, sure, great, that's fine. Now, for those who know my financial situation when I got my first job, I was, I needed as much money as I could get. And I was living with my mom, who is not uh, a faithful member of the church, and then I was told that I had to be at a meeting for Toys R Us on a Sunday morning. And so I told my manager, I can't be there, like we talked when I was hired, I have to be at church. And she said, well, we're going to pay you for that time that you're here. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Well, my, uh, and they did, they did let me not be part of it, so that was good on Toys R Us. Um, my mom was mad about it. She was like, you can't afford to, not, I had to miss an opportunity to work. And I was like, Mom, first of all, it was only two hours I would have been paid for. It's not a huge drop in the bucket, you know. <laughs> uh, I think it was only like $8 an hour, so... <laughs> uh, but she, uh, she couldn't uh, get, that, get around that, and she made, tried to f- make me feel ashamed of it. And I said, Mom, I, I promise you, it'll be fine. And I'm not joking. The next day, so Sunday comes around, and then it's Monday. Monday, I get a call on a day that I was not scheduled for two hours to work. <laughs> so... so I can't say for sure that it was the providence of God, but do you, you better believe, I'm pretty sure it might be the providence of God there. And it's little things like that in your life. If you look back on a time that you prayed and you can look specifically at something and say, aha, there's a time that I know for sure God was listening to me and hold on to that. And maybe that will help you restart that confidence that the psalmist here has in his God that we need to have in our God. So the next next few verses that we're going to look at, verses 3 through 10, we're going to see the next point here. We should pray why? Because God listens, and number two, because God cares. Look in verses 3 through 10 here. The psalmist says, For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I lie awake, and I'm like a sparrow alone on the housetop. My enemies approach me all day long. Those who deride me swear an oath against me. For I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of your indignation and your wrath, for you have lifted me up and cast me away. What do you guys notice about the way the psalmist speaks to God here? What what is his tone like towards God? Does he treat does he talk to God like He is some faraway, distant being. How does does he speak about God here? How would you describe it? He's one you can ask for help, right? Well, yes. That's right. He's given him a deep perspective on what's going on in his life. He's pouring out his heart, isn't he? Who in your life are you willing to pour your heart out to? Just anybody? Or does it have to be somebody pretty close? Like like maybe a a best friend, a close friend, right? You don't share your deepest uh, inward thoughts with just anyone. You you, You might not even share them with your mom or your dad. But there's that friend in your life who you know is going to hear you out 
and he's not going to right away cast the hammer of judgment on you and he is going to listen. He's, he speaks to his God like he's his friend, isn't he? His closest friend. And notice here, he's not being fake with God. He's being honest. He's being honest with him. And like Cheryl Ann pointed out here, he's not sparing the details, right? He's getting down to what is it that is bothering him? What are, what are the things that are making him feel uh, uh, this stress? And that gives us something that we need to recognize here. Stress is a legitimate reason to pray. It's God wants us to praise him. Yes, God wants us to ask him of things. Yes, God wants us to ask on behalf of other people. Yes, but also God wants you to come to him when you are feeling stressed, when you're feeling strung out, when you feel like you can't do, when you feel like you can't go on. He wants to hear it. He wants you to come to him and bring these things to him. Uh, look at individually these things that he, that he mentions. In, uh, in verse 3, he says, My days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass. He's speaking there of, the, of exhaustion, isn't he? He's feeling weak. Uh, imagine, uh, what, we don't know ex what the psalmist was specifically dealing with here, but can you, are there times you felt weak? Like you weren't able to measure up to what you needed to be? There are times where you felt like you, know, you needed to, I mean, in the case of faith, that you maybe you didn't stand as strong as you needed to. Maybe you weren't, you weren't standing as strong for somebody who needed it. God is here to listen for that. Listen to how the next thing, he says, my heart is stricken and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. You know what that sounds like to me? Sounds like a man with a broken heart. You ever felt so sorrowful, so crushed that you couldn't even eat? The thought of, of, of eating makes you sick. The psalmist is speaking like we do, doesn't he? He feels like we feel. And God put these words in his Bible. God wanted us to know that these are things that we can bring before God. Listen to his, his groaning here. He says in verse 5, Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. I, I picture here, like, maybe he has been so sorrowful that he's not eaten in so long that he's maybe literally becoming emaciated. His, his, uh, you can see uh, his bones in, in his face or in, in his hands because he's just not taking care of himself. Didn't, feeling this way doesn't exclude him from being able to pray to God. It's what God wants us to do. Bring that sorrow before the Lord. There's, this, uh, there's a couple phrases in here that might sound weird to us. What's a pelican in the wilderness? What's an what's a owl of the desert? A pelican uh, would have been an unclean animal. It would have been considered uh, 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 unholy. And so he describes this, this word that brings up thirst to us, right? Verse 6, I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I picture the thirstiness. What is he thirsty for in this case? Well, if a pelican represents uncleanness, is he thirsty for righteousness? Why would he be praying this? It's kind of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it, it might be lost. Might, unable to quench himself. Um, there was that question that I asked with that first point of like, maybe we don't go to God to pray because, because, we, don't, because we feel ashamed of what we've done. Uh, and we feel like we need to separate ourselves from God, treat ourselves like we are unclean, treat ourselves like we need to be excluded from the temple, excluded from the church, because we, we don't belong, we're not 
we're not holy like the rest of them. But do we need? Do we still need God when we're fe- uh, when we're not uh, when we're sinful? Do we need to, do we still need God when we need to be drawn back to righteousness? Yes. And when we're feeling this way, that's a legitimate reason to pray to God. What better reason could be there to p- pray for God when we need His forgiveness? When we need His righteousness? The owl of the des- uh, of the desert br- uh, should bring to mind desolation. Uh, that searching for sustenance, that uh, an, an animal being a nocturnal animal is searching in the night, looking for any scrap of, of, uh, of meat that he can get. We need righteousness. We need God when we're feeling, or when we have done wrong. Uh, in verse 6, he says, I'm like a, uh, or sorry, he uh, um now, verse 7, he says, I lie awake, and I'm like a sparrow alone in the, on the housetop. You ever have sleepless nights? <laughs> ever feel lonely? He then talks about his enemies in verse 8. Reproach me all day long. Those who deride me swear an oath against me. For I've eaten, like ash, I've eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of your indignation and your wrath for you have lifted me up and cast me away. Eating ashes like bread, uh, ashes, uh, who knows what, uh, when, in Jewish culture, in the Old Testament, what, when were ashes brought up? Leprosy. Hmm? Leprosy. Leprosy, right? And when else? Mourning and weeping. So in a time where you could not be a member of the, uh, of the congregation, and in a, during a time of mourning and weeping, and then he talks about this, this sparrow, about feeling, feeling sleepless. Do you guys ever feel, or do you, do, uh, when, when you mourn and you weep, do you feel lonely sometimes? Is there, is there a case uh, in your life where that might occur? Do you know we can pray to God about that loneliness? Do you know when we've suffered loss, when, we've, when, when people die, when, when we've lost loved ones, we can go to God, and He's going to make us not feel lonely anymore. And in fact, that's, what, that's one of the reasons He has the church. One of the ways He can answer that prayer is by sending your brothers and sisters to you. Because they know how to please God. And then, and then the last thing here is He, uh, he expresses an, a, uh, an, a, a bit of guilt in verse 10. Feeling like, like God is punishing him. That it's God that's brought these sorrows on. Uh, feeling like we need to put our blame off on God. We do that too often. But when we feel that way, does that make us unworthy of God's, uh, to pray, unworthy to pray to God? No. Bring it to him. And he is going to answer that prayer. He is going to uh, uh, cover you in that love that he offers to every one of us. How can I know this? How can we know this? Do we not believe? Do we not believe that God is going to carry our loads? Do we not believe that God is going to take these burdens on himself and answer them for us? We believe that, don't we? Did the psalmist believe it? Oh, yeah. That's why he's laying all these out there. He's, putting, he's being intimate with God. He's not sparing the details. He's being honest and telling him what is on his mind because he knows that God is listening and that he is one who is going to help him bear these burdens. Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30. I'll turn there really quickly. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Jesus says, come to me, all, come to me, all, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
This is not a God who wants you to carry your burdens all by himself, all by yourself. He wants you to rely on him. He wants you to bring those burdens before him. We need to know that we can't waste God's time. When we, when we pray to God, he's got all the time in the universe. And he's spending it for each one of us. His time is infinite. And we won't be a bother to him. We can then be specific with the things that are afflicting us. Be specific to God about the things that are keeping us down, that are keeping us unfaithful, the things that are keeping us from growing in faith, uh, the things that are bringing us sorrow, that are bringing us grief, we can cast those on God. Uh, and this is something I think that a lot of us may struggle with. Um, sometimes we let our humility cause us to think that we need to hold back. Maybe our, uh, we want to be so humble that we think, well, my cares aren't that important enough for God. And so we don't bring them before him. If I'm struggling with this or I'm struggling with that, we think, had God's got better things to do, but that is the furthest thing from the case. Look at the way that the psalmist spells out his cares. We don't have to hold back. So when you were a child uh, and you needed to talk to your mother or father about what was bothering you, did you hold back? Or did you burst out in tears and sob into their arms? Did you let them pat you on the back and say, they're there? Of course. Because you feel safe in their arms. You feel like you can trust them. You feel that, that, that they're going to bring that comfort we can have that same relationship and an even better relationship with God if we're willing to lay it out for him, treat him like the father that he is and tells us that he wants to be for us. So then verses 11 through 28, we're going to see uh, the third thing there, that God endures. Um, First thing to notice is that God is everlasting. Looking, uh, look at these, ver uh, let's read this verse of the passage here, starting in verse 11. My days are like a shadow that lengthens, and I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, shall endure forever, and the remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to, uh, to favor her. Yes, the, time, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor for her, uh, to her dust. So the nations shall fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. This will be written for the generation to come that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven the Lord viewed the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to release those appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. He awakened my strength in the way. He shortened my days. I said, O oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. The children of your servants will continue, and their descendants will be established before you. So, of course, this, this psalm is, is speaking about, about the future of Israel, about the future of Judah, but the overall theme that we keep seeing him get back to here over and over again is, but you will endure. Uh, God is everlasting. He does not end. In verse 12, we see his name endures. In verse 13, it's his mercy that endures. In verse 14 through 22, we see his promises endure. And then from 23 to 28, 
we see it's his nature itself that endures. What is it that makes him God? That does not end. That does not change. It is everlasting. We, therefore, can rest assured that God is going to answer when we call. Verse 17. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute and shall not despise their prayer. This infinite God, this God who's going to endure through the time of captivity of Israel, this God who's going to endure through the, uh, through the return of Israel, this God who's going, to inter, uh, who's going to endure through the church when it arises, and that church that will never be, uh, will never be destroyed, that kingdom, God is going to be there answering the prayers of his people. We can rest assured that God's going to answer when we call. Uh, God, is, um, God is, has the power to answer, doesn't he? he? He molded the universe in his hands is what we see in these, in these verses. He created everything. There's not a thing that God cannot do. And so our prayers are the easiest thing for him to answer. And he will always be there to answer them. Why? Because he has the heart to answer. It's within him. It's in his nature to answer our prayers. He is mercy. He is love. And so when we bring our cares before him, that merciful God, that, that loving God is answering those prayers. So when we grow weary, we can rely on our God who endures. So there's, there's an old saying, right? God will never give you more than you can handle. You've heard that, right? Who here thinks that that's true? <laughs> Have you ever felt like you've get, been given something that you just couldn't handle? Yes, every single one of us has had something in their life that they could not handle. And to say that that's something that God uh, teaches is antithetical to God because God does, does God not know that life is overwhelming? Uh, look at Psalm, just really quickly, Psalm 34, 17 through 20 where he says, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and save such as, a contrite, uh, as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. God, it is not true that God doesn't give you more than you, uh, you can handle. Life is going to give you more than, than you can handle. The bad decisions we make because of the sin in our lives is going to give us more than we can handle. And God wants to be the one to help us handle it. And he's promised us that he will when we bring those cares to him in prayer. We can't miss that. God is more trustworthy than any friend that we've had in our lives. God is more trustworthy than any parent that we've had in our lives. God is perfect. He is eternal. And so his loving kindness, his mercy, his, uh, uh, his listening ear are just as eternal and his promise to answer our prayers are eternal. Here's the takeaway that I want for you uh, this evening. Psalm 102 is a prayer that you can pray. Yeah, yeah, there's some stuff about Israel and, and whatnot in there, but this is a prayer that was designed for the congregation to sing together, right? It was a prayer designed for holy people of God to say with confidence. When you need to be strengthened, or when you need to be uh, reassured that God is listening, when you need to be reassured that God cares for you, and when you need to be reassured that God is going to endure, you can go to Psalm 102 and have all those things reassured. Why do you need to pray? Because God listens. Why do you need to pray? Because God cares. Why do you need to pray? Because God endures. And no matter what is on our heart, he will answer those things for us. I really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you.